everybody. I'm Jesse Waters, along with Kimberly Guilfoyle, Juan Williams, Dana Perino, and Kennedy. It's 5 o'clock in New York City, and this is The Five. Tonight is a resolution coming soon to stop the anthem protests on the football field. NFL owners, players, and execs coming together today in New York to iron out how to settle the storm. President Trump has called on the league to suspend players if they kneel during the Star Spangled Banner. Colin Kaepernick started the protest last season to raise awareness about racial inequality. He's now filed a grievance against the league, claiming owners are colluding to keep him out. The NFL and Players Union issued a joint statement after the meeting, calling it productive. This Eagles player, who attended, had positive things to say. I felt like the, the meeting went really well. Um, obviously, we've been, we've been uh, invited up here to, to be able to speak with owners about uh, some of the, the issues of injustice that we've seen uh, in our communities and how, uh, as players, we want to use our platforms. And, and we just talked about how uh, the owners could come alongside us and we could collectively, collaboratively um, work together to, to actually create some change. Outside the headquarters, Black Lives Matter demonstrators held a protest of their own. Take a knee against white supremacy. Take a knee against white supremacy. Take a knee against white supremacy. Okay. So, um, two part question for you, KG. One, um, white supremacy didn't know that's what taking the kneel was protesting against. But two, Positive development between the players and the owners. How do you predict this thing going? Look, I think that it's going to ultimately go in the right direction because they want to bring some closure to this and yeah. have some resolution. It's not good, you know, for anybody. They sort of, okay, made the point, and now you can go out and do, you know, community outreach and continue to strive on behalf of social justice and whatever you would like to express your opinion for in this country. That's why it's so incredible. But at the same time, you can also, you know, do the job that you were contracted to do and abide by the NFL's rules. Um, Roger Goodell, yes, showing some leadership now, but unfortunately, Fortunately, you know, leadership needs to head off uh, crises like this and be there to make sure that all sides feel they're being well represented, that their voices are being heard, that people are listening, because otherwise then you have sort of this, um, you know, mismatched evolution of what was initially supposed to be about, uh, you know, police injustice, police shootings, and now you're hearing them now spin it. It's got a side message, which is white supremacy. So you've got to kind of figure out and follow the bouncing ball. And it looks like the owners, Juan, uh, are seeing ratings go down, uh, stadiums. Mm -hmm. I think we have some pictures. Not all seats are filled up. That's a problem with attendance. And they want to wrap this thing up. And I'm sure the players want the heat off them as well. Do you think that's true? Yeah, I think the players would like to have some resolution. I think they don't like being disrespected. They don't like being called SOBs by the President of the United States. They don't like being threatened first by the President in terms of calling on NFL owners, many of whom are big Trump supporters, uh, to fire them and being told the owners that they're afraid of their black players. Boy. Uh, and then, of course, I think there's resistance even when Jerry Jones, the head of the Cowboys, says, oh, he's going to put in place a rule. Quickly, the NFL said prior to this meeting today, there is no requirement that the players uh, stand. They would like them to it's stand. A suggestion. Yeah, but it's not a requirement. There will be no punishment. So I think that in, in today's atmosphere, everybody would like to see some resolution. I disagree with you, by the way. I mean, the numbers on terms of the ratings, in terms of the capacity, it's, you know, most stadiums are unchanged. There are some that are down slightly. Like More my, are down than are not. Mo most are unchanged. That's a fact. But here are, here, at my favorite team, the Washington football team, TV ratings they went from 84%. I'm about percent. I know, but yeah. also TV ratings, ratings are, are down and attendance it's, is down it's, more it's than it's negligible. 84 no. to 82 percent at Washington football stadium at FedEx Field this last yeah, Sunday. Yeah, but what if it's 2 percent next week and the week after that? It could and be. The week I don't that, know. That, that, Starts right, to but, add I, up. but I'm saying right now we are into this, and we remember last year Colin Kaepernick was there starting this controversy, Kennedy, and we didn't see it. So my point though is I think the resolution is along these lines. What you'll see is the NFL saying we're going to invest in commercials, advertising about social justice issues. We are going to back 
criminal justice reform in the Congress. We're going to take positive action so it's not just about kneeling, but it's about substantive change. And on that score, hats off to the NFL. And that's a great idea. Speaking of Colin Kaepernick, he was invited to the meeting today and did not show up. Mm. It's really interesting because he really could be the face of this movement. And I agree with Kimberly. I think when you have something like this and, and you're really marching in the same direction and you're going somewhere, we have yet to determine where that where is mm -hmm. uh, he should be the face. He should be the one saying this is our next step. Uh, Dana leaned over to me as we were watching some of the video <laughs> after the meeting. She said, I want these people to get along. Aww. And she said, don't you know? Absolutely. Why can't we but, all just get but along? Think about it, but in these communities, these football players are superstars, not just to the fans, but to the cops who are also huge sports fans. Mm -hmm. So how much of a difference could they make if they sat down with law enforcement and said, hey, these have been uh, some of the circumstances I've witnessed in my life. These these are some of my friends who have been pulled over and put into the system. What can we do to change this? This is how we do our job. How do you do your job? And, and how can we somehow bring the two together to make the entire issue better? Great constructive idea. And as a matter of fact, last year, law enforcement deaths in the line of duty were up substantially. So, uh, you know, they're under a lot of pressure as well. Dana, I want to play some sound from Martha's show last night. Interesting suggestion from former Green Beret and NFL player Nate Boyer. Listen. I just think it'd be a powerful uh, notion just to see two people that are obviously, you know, on the opposite ends of the spectrum, uh, you know, during this, this whole situation. Just as an example for our country, you know, we need to listen to each other more, uh, whether you agree with, with, with others or not, and just have these conversations. I should have previewed it. He was talking about Colin Kaepernick mm -hmm. sitting down with President Trump. I think, uh, look, why not? Or like a beer and, summit. <laughs> yeah, like the beer summit. Um, but, but, oh but with God. sincerity um, <laughs> instead. Um, I do think that President Trump is in a great position, actually, right now. If the NFL now has just come out and said, we're for criminal justice reform, and you have bipartisan support in the House and the Senate, with some co-sponsors um, to say we're for criminal justice reform too. Like, Rand Paul likes why that. wouldn't Rand you Paul want to just Booker. drive that forward and be the leader on that? Like if if it's there for the taking, make it happen. That is. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if Jeff Sessions is going to buy in, Dana. Because, but does he have a choice? Well, not if a the president, president, not the says, president right, gets If there, the president says, but, you know, I want this done. Remember, they undid so many of the kind of consent decrees local police departments had about working yep. with. Community. No, I know, but I do think that if the president said, especially now to Jeff Sessions, this is what I want done. The, he could, the, the power of the president is amazing to convene, I agree. No, bring no people doubt. together, and say, let's get this worked out by the end of the day. What an amazing photo op, Colin Kaepernick and President Trump. President Trump could look like the big healer in chief. He could yep. look like the better man. Yep. And uh, maybe Kaepernick, after he met with the president, might get signed. Might help with his PR, Juan. <laughs> it might. He might take a knee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, if he does that, Trump's going to have the Secret Service. Oh, is that right? Some, somehow, I don't know if that's going to go so well. But, um, you know, Dante Stallworth, you guys are familiar with him. He's also a CNN contributor. But he mm. was saying on Saturday that it's not just about, you know, social injustice and uh, police crimes or police excessive force or brutality. It's about um, gender inequality Whoa. gender, pay, gender pay, pay, pay gap. the uh -huh. pay gap between so and it's about housing discrimination Ooh. so the list is evolving that is an extensive net right wow. see what i'm saying so it's just okay and it's also about this and so, then it's about dry cleaning is unequal in price. It really is. And when it's not environmentally friendly. Exactly. I'm not for that, actually. Yeah, so that was no, the So point. add that to the list. We've had, and we've had this discussion, Juan, because now the grievances have metastasized. It's six or seven things on the laundry list. It was first about police brutality, and now it's about dry cleaning. As well, Kimberly I says. made that part. Well, obviously, <laughs> she's joking, but it's very confusing, and I think that this added not, to the problem. This is not confusing. I don't know. You know but to me... You know, this comes back to something Dana and I were talking about. We're talking about Condi Rice saying, you know what, she can understand the complaint. But if you have strategically mounted an offensive that allows your critics to say it's about something else, you've made a mistake. Right. And so here we have a situation where the critics of the players say, oh, this is about disrespecting the flag, disrespecting the anthem. I don't think that's what the players are about. 
I don't even think the players are about disrespecting police. They say they don't like police brutality. OK, but what about what about this? Um, Scott Walker proposed that perhaps the NFL can address the problem within the league of domestic violence. Sure. And, and maybe that should be, you yeah. know, because obviously that, that's and the that, homicides that, that, that has happened. to be addressed. And, you know, perhaps it, it is getting to encompass too many issues. But that is a major issue that uh, the NFL hasn't appropriately, uh, you know, taken care of with some of their own players. They're right, but I think right. that goes back to the Ray Rice situation in Baltimore with the videotape of him hitting the, the I think it was his wife or girlfriend in an elevator. No, and I don't another think there's one any being question, put in the trunk. But that's not what this was about, and that's not what Colin Kaepernick started to do. Hmm. So lots of things get piled on. So I was curious when I, I was thinking to myself, what are they saying? Because remember, I'm half mm -hmm. deaf. So I, I had to rely on Jesse, who said it's, they're shouting end to white supremacy. You yes. Say? yes. So, to me, I don't see how that, I mean, clearly people have arguments. I know some people on the far left say it's about systemic racism in the society, and they want their heroes, the football players, to use their platform to raise this issue. This is, by the way, one aspect, Jesse, never gets raised in your calculation. So many of these fans are black people. Mm -hmm. So when you have Jess, Jerry Jones and these other people saying this and that, it's almost like, oh, the white fans are going to abandon us. You do this. Right. And the white conservative Republican fans are going to abandon us. Hey, guess what? They're black fans and they're liberal fans well, who say, wait a second. Uh, we want people to be socially aware and care about their communities. Well, I, I think it's less of a race issue than it is about patriotism. And I do want to add that Mark Garagos, the high-priced attorney for Colin Kaepernick, says that Cap was not invited to the meeting. Maybe some of the players wanted him to go. He didn't get his paperless post. He did. I, don't, I think he missed that. <laughs> I, I hate it when that happened. He didn't click on the envelope. I that was it. right. So that, that was an incomplete pass with, uh, with Kaepernick. You know, right. Sports Illustrated didn't put him on the cover either. Uh, that, well, that's a jinx, so maybe he didn't want that. Well, anyway. and the swimsuit issue hasn't come out oh, yet. Oh, that's, so. that's true. Right. Good point. That's right. It is 2017. Maybe he can wear his socks with the suit. Oh. <laughs> just the socks. Definitely <laughs> not just that. Coming up, ISIS nearly done. Today we got an incredible update on the war on terror from the Pentagon. ISIS is losing in every way. We've devastated their networks, targeted and eliminated their leaders at all levels. Today in Syria, ISIS is losing its grip. After more than four months of operations, Raqqa is more than 90 percent cleared. This pleases me so much. I can watch that over and over again. Raqqa is the de facto capital of ISIS, and that is big news. U.S.-backed forces are nearly in control of the city, the terror network on the verge of defeat. General Jack Keane credits the Trump administration for finally getting the job done. The Obama administration has always been paralyzed by fear of adverse consequence. What happens if this happens? What happens if it goes wrong? It always paralyzed them. This thing should have been over a number of years ago. This new administration came in, new team around this president, new national security team was saying, we're going after this thing, going to bring it down as quickly as we can. Dana, comment on Jack Keane? Well, <laughs> he um, has the best perspective, right? Because he was there at the beginning and he knows what happens if you have a vacuum. And Absolutely. I actually think that, so this is great news. I do think though that once ISIS is defeated, then we have to ask the question, and what is the U.S. role going to be? We know what happens when we walk away. That's what General Keane was just saying. Yep. So we have a problem but that Iran has been extending its influence in the region. And at the same time, you have another problem happening right now in Iraq, just in that um, Kurdistan region, where the, the big oil-rich re right. region. So you have the, all the fighters that were countering ISIS, that would be Turkey, Syrian Kurds, um, Arabs, Iraqi Kurds, Iranian-backed fighters, and us, we were all working together to defeat ISIS. Now they're actually all fighting each other mm -hmm. so that they can deal with that region. So there are, this is great news in terms of ISIS being back down and to only having 10% of its territory left, but there are some big looming problems on the horizon. You know, Kennedy, because Dana brings up such an important point, we, we get caught up yes, in the victory of it and the decisiveness and that really these kind of uh, accomplishments have been achieved rather quickly, you know, under the Trump administration with the focus plan on it. Fantastic. However, what do you do about all these warring factions that are now competing to control the territory that were united against a common enemy, but now splintered against one another? It's interesting because um, that is the uniting factor. Fighting mm -hmm. ISIS has been, and it's wonderful to see their defeat because they want to see us dead and they hate freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are antithetical to our wonderful way of life. However, the Kurds have been our biggest ally in the Middle East and a very reliable ally at that.
when we see in so many places shifting alliances and we think we're friends with someone we give them a bunch of weapons and then they turn around and use them on us the Kurds they want independence they just passed a referendum and they turn around and here you know the people they were fighting with to defeat ISIS are now attacking them in Kirkuk to mm -hmm. Dana's point and it, it's really frustrating but at some point it's so complicated it's so convoluted and it's so deadly mm. we spent 1.7 trillion dollars in Iraq since 2003 yeah. what are we getting out of it what are That's our it. American interests at this point I think we should be supporting the Kurds and I think we should be supporting their independence but at the same time we have to look at places like Turkey and say yes. maybe you're not a good ally maybe you're not a good friend same with right. Saudi Arabia yeah. you know and, and they could be doing more That's absolutely for sure. so what do you say to Such the Iraqis point. because they don't want the, an independent Kurdish area in the north, just like the Turks don't want the, the Kurds extending across Tough the border. Tough Tetons. Yeah, you know but what? I mean, Tough the Tetons, thing is... and, and I'm sorry, but Iraq and Syria don't exist in the way that they did uh, 15 yes. years ago. Well, I mean, remember, I think it was Vice President Biden who said maybe we should just draw sections then, you know, kind of divide up what was well, Iraq. But the thing is, but we have that's to come to the American... table to do that. Don't you think, Juan, to be very helpful to help facilitate that before they start taking matters into their own hands to it kind could, of be the I conduit mean, for those discussions? Right. So when you look at who won this effort, I think that the efforts won, as I understand it, by the Syrian Democratic Forces, mostly Kurdish. I think we do have a debt to them. We we yeah. supplied them with tremendous air power in terms of bombings. Yes, and, we did. And I, you know, I, I was just listening. You know, say, oh, you know, the, the Obama administration was so worried about consequences, and I was just today looking through the material. And it said thousands of people killed, two hundred and seventy thousand displaced, homes leveled. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that you have somebody describing the conditions in Raqqa, Mosul and Ramadi as Hiroshima-like. Yeah. And I'm thinking, wow, I didn't know. But that's what it's, it looks like you now. You can imagine, right? And Especially course, after the And area. remember, the displacement led to the, the immigrant crisis that spread through Turkey into uh, mm -hmm. Europe. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of consequences. And that's why I was so impressed by you two, Dane and Kennedy, saying, now we have to think about where it goes from here, because we want to control it. We do not want a repeat of what we saw after uh, the Iraqi forces ended in war, and then we saw the creation of ISIS out of the remnants of that military force. Mm -hmm. Well, Juan, prepare to be impressed by me. Yes, sir. Now I'm going to lay down some law. So Never under, miss an opportunity. <laughs> under President Obama, ISIS grew to control a third of Iraq. That's about the size of the state of Indiana. Now, under President Trump, ISIS controls 3% of Iraq, which is like the smallest county in Indiana. I'm not saying President Trump deserves a lot of the credit, but you know, a lot of credit does go to these local forces, but he really unleashed hell on ISIS yeah. by loosening the rules of engagement, by letting Mattis go in there and starting to kill people, not just well, contain them. We're turning the rules of engagement to what they were prior to the Obama administration. Precisely. Lawyers weren't calling in airstrikes. They intensified the airstrikes. So I think ISIS now on the ropes is a good development. Yes, there's some ugly scenarios, but sometimes those are the ugly consequences of war. You said also there's a lot of problems with these armed militias. You know, there's like the Shiite militias now from Iran. There we have the Kurds, they're armed. A lot of these people might settle some old ethnic scores. Yeah. I like to stay away from that. I don't think we should divide the country into three. That's just going to increase Iran's power. You know, you need a strong bulwark geographically against there. But the main issue here is, Kimberly, that ISIS doesn't control the vast land mass where they have control of oil profits. Because yeah. the oil profits were generating their were finances, doing. which were generating their ability to can wage I, war on the civilian you population. You don't need a new ISIS power. trying right. to reestablish the caliphate. Can I ask you a quick question, though? Because obviously we only have so much money and we're we're really over leveraged in this country it's obvious just look at the the debt that we've got um, if if you had to choose between somehow propping up Iraq and parts of the Middle East or building the wall which is going to cost upwards of 90 billion dollars what do you choose well since Mexico's paying for the oh wall my God. I think oh we can have God. both oh if Mexico can pay for our continuing here, how many people Kimberly. think Kimberly. that's going to be his Halloween uh, costume what day do you know that was a good spin okay it was good spin. Yeah. This he's, comes he's from like the that professional Spin, right a now. lot of spin in the waters world. All right, President Trump is set to declare the opioid crisis a national emergency. But on the opioid crisis next week, he's expected to declare the epidemic a national emergency. This on the heels of a blockbuster 60 Minutes report that exposed Congress for being manipulated by the pharmaceutical industry. Why are these people sponsoring bills when people in their backyards are dying 
from drugs that are coming from the same people that these bills are protecting. Why do you think that is? Because I think that the drug industry, the manufacturers, wholesalers, distributors, and chain drug stores have an influence over Congress that has never been seen before. Congressman Tom Marino has withdrawn his name for consideration to be the nation's drug czar after being highlighted as a champion of a bill that weakened the federal government's authority to stop companies from distributing opiates. So, um, Juan, that was old-fashioned investigative news reporting that led to that report that had a consequence, at least with one person withdrawing their name. I but there might be more to come from this. I think there's a lot more to come, Dana, but, I mean, let's just stop for a second and look at the consequences of not only the drug companies, but the middlemen leading then to the drug stores. The distributors. Pumping mm -hmm. these opioids into communities. Joe Manchin, the senator from We West have that, actually. Can I play it? And get Please, you go right ahead. Uh, Joe Manchin. This is how bad this system is. This has been a business plan. I have said this from day one. In West Virginia, I know Mingo County, I know Kermit, West Virginia. When you have less than 400 people and send 9 million pills down there, mm. you tell me that's not a business plan that you don't want to make money off of it. My goodness, you've got to be stuffing pills down people's throat, men, women, and children. Mm. This is uncalled for. Yeah. It's criminal. Sure. That's what you were talking about, Juan. Exactly. I mean, just, I mean, Jesse even, like, was a, what is going on? 400 and you're sending millions of pills? What are you doing? How can that be justified? So then the Congress gets involved, Dana, and whereas previously it was that the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, could stop shipments if they looked like they were being overdone and headed to the black market, they could stop it on, suspicious, on the basis of suspicious behavior. The drug industry then goes to Congress and says, oh no, they're getting involved with free enterprise here. We should be making this decision. The standard is raised. It has to be imminent and substantial threat, which is almost impossible to prove. And as a result, the flow of these opioids continue. Kim Kimberly, do you yeah. um, think that the companies are going to ha see some new regulation out of this, or will it just continue? I actually believe there's going to be new regulation. I've never seen the level of discussion highlighting this epidemic, really like a, a focus on it. I saw it during the campaign with Governor Christie. I've seen it continue now with President Trump. Governor Christie was there discussing this with the president last week. So I think that this is something that he really wants to get done, at least especially for, you know, President Trump. This is something very personal to him, you know, having lost his brother to addiction and I think he understands very personally and uniquely like the, the struggle that families go through that are crippled by this and families mm -hmm. destroyed and, and the first lady has parents. actually taken it on as one of her issues. Absolutely. But Kennedy, what do you think about declaring this a national emergency? Uh, I think it fans the flames of hysteria. You've actually seen more prohibition on these prescription pills in various states. They've been cracking down on doctors who dispense them and pharmacies who also allow for these prescriptions. So what you're seeing is more prohibition and more deaths from opioids, including fentanyl. And people aren't getting fentanyl from the pharmacy. That's what Prince died of. People aren't getting it from the pharmacy. Uh, poor people with mental illness are getting fentanyl on the street, and they're getting addicted to fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And they will openly talk about wanting to shoot fentanyl. They don't want to shoot heroin anymore. And, uh, and that's a problem, is you criminalize this mm -hmm. when it really China is, sending it it is in a too. national health crisis. And we should be putting people in rehab. We should be helping people with their combined mental illness and drug addiction, instead of throwing them in cages, we really have to shift the conversation. We really right. have to help people because we're looking in the wrong place and stopping the wrong thing. Dual diagnosis. Jesse, your thoughts. Problem. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the epidemic of opioids is really the story of the swamp. I think 15 years ago, these drug companies came and told Congress these pills were not addicted, sure. addictive. So Congress fast tracks the approval process, and now you have these distributors pumping these pills into mining towns, into towns in the industrial Midwest where people do back-breaking labor and get paid minimum wage, into towns where people have come back from Iraq and Afghanistan mm -hmm. and are using the VA. So they don't really actually kill the pain. What they do is they mask the pain. They're not treating the underlying problem. The underlying problem can be solved through operations, through physical therapy, through diet, through mental health therapy, but that doesn't profit companies. Companies make profits when people continue to be in pain, and that's why 
they continue to get addicted. And yet there is a problem. If Greg were here, we would talk about people who actually are in pain that need access they to do, it. They do, but they don't need it. Like they don't need a million pills in a small town of 400 people. That's, I would agree with that. Obviously, I can even do that math. Um, okay, next up, Jane Fonda. Guess what? She's back at it. Go on. Jane Fonda <laughs> still isn't feeling the love for her country. She's hating on the U.S. again. <laughs> are you proud of America today? No, but... But let, well, uh, I'm proud of the resistance. I'm proud of the people who are turning out in unprecedented numbers and continue over and over and over again but, to protest what Trump is doing. I'm very proud of the, that right, core. But, but, you know, just oh, dear Lord. She's not proud of America, but she sure is proud she went to Vietnam to sit on an enemy's anti-aircraft gun. I don't regret going to Vietnam. I'm proud that I went. It changed my life, all for the good. The thing that I regret is that on my last day there, I made the mistake of going to a ceremony at an anti-aircraft gun. I sat down and laughing, and, and then I got up, and as I walked away, I realized, oh my gosh, it's going to look like I am against my own country's soldiers and siding with the enemy, which is the, the, the last thing in the world that was true. Mm -hmm. Wow, it seems as though she's apologized for her trip to Vietnam in the past, Juan, but uh, I guess you can take the commie out of Vietnam, but you can't take the commie out of the commie. <laughs> wow, I'll leave wow. that alone. <laughs> I will say, I think she made a terrible mistake. I mean, it wasn't a popular war. I think even to this day, most Americans have a very negative view of the Vietnam War. But uh, I think it was the idea that she seemed to be anti-American soldier and even anti-U.S. in the course of that. Now, she says she's proud of the resistance today. I don't think anybody would argue with that. But the resistance back then, I think, is something that she damaged by sitting in the cockpit of that North anti -aircraft Vietnamese. Anti-aircraft guy. Yeah, I mean, that's crazy. You used to shoot down American soldiers. I don't know how you defend uh, So is it possible to live in this country where there is political disagreement and still be proud of it, Jesse? Uh, well, what did Michelle Obama say? This is the first time in my life I've been proud to be an American. So um, I, I just think Jane Fonda's renaissance helps Donald Trump. I mean, he cannot get better foils. It's either Hillary or President Obama, Jane Fonda, Kathy Griffin. They keep coming up and, and, and kneeling during the anthem, <laughs> rioting. I mean, God, you cannot ask for better enemies. So I, as long as Jane's in the news, I think that's good. Uh, but she did give aid and comfort to the enemy. And I do not believe her saying that she was upset that she was anti-American soldier, anti-American. She went on the Hanai broadcast, yes. did a radio yeah. interview where she told vicious lies. America wanted to colonize Vietnam. Mm -hmm. American soldiers were deserting at record numbers. American officers were drunks. Nixon is a racist murderer. I mean, it's insane. And to say that she's not a traitor or didn't give aid and comfort when I think her photo op prolonged the Vietnam War. It brought North Vietnam away from the negotiating table. Mm. When soldiers came back, POWs, Americans from North Vietnam, and they said that they were tortured, she called those soldiers liars mm -hmm. and hypocrites. So Jane has been wrong about so many things. She's wrong again. Well, for somebody who is she so, makes my blood boil. I, I know. mean, she she really and I, I can't let go of the Vietnam thing and the fact that she has absolutely no contrition. It it drives me insane. Although, I mean, she o she's only feels bad that it looked like it, that the self aware that her image look, took a hit. Yeah. Right. So, yes. um, but also what's weird about that is that she's so self-aware about everything else in her life, right? So that she seemed to have a momentary lapse and that was, I think she's figured out that that's the best talking point to get her out of those interviews yeah. and, and those situations. I also don't understand why somebody in that position doesn't try to lift America up. Regard that Whoever the president is, that's a temporary thing. Um, in four or eight years that any president is going to be uh, a former president. So. Why can't you try to lift people up and say, like, of course I'm proud of this country. It doesn't matter who the president is. Mm. Yeah. And, and we are strong enough as Americans but to, to try disagree. to like, make people feel worse about their and, country. And, that's, and, like and you know what drives me crazy is we've had such a wonderful conversation about Vietnam mm -hmm. with the Ken's Burn, Ken Burns documentary, yes, which I've talked about. Fan and, and the point of that documentary was to heal some of those wounds, which right. are still simmering. And instead of, you know, and I think that's a very positive step. I think what she's doing is incredibly negative and divisive. She reminds me of Hillary Clinton in the way she makes excuses. Absolutely.
absolutely, and she makes it about herself. I mean, it's, it's really disgusting to even hear her talk about it again. Tell that to all the people who lost family members or for the, those in the military that bravely served in Vietnam. Um, she's trying to, like, make light of it, to say, oh, she didn't know she was making funny faces. Bull. Mm -hmm. She knew what she was doing. She did that at the time. It was purposeful, and it's just inexcusable because, by the way, who did she think she was to go over there and pass judgment on those that were serving this country and upholding an oath? And for her to still talk about it now just brings open, you know, old wounds. Well, don't pretend that it was an ideal war. I mean, obviously, the president. I'm not saying it was time, ideal. The president at the difficult. time was, but her was behavior. Lying. She didn't. Was she didn't make. It, she didn't make a bad situation any better. That's no, her. she sure didn't.